Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is the Academic Resource Center, the Academic Success Webinar Series. Um, and today we're going to be talking about classroom engagement. I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Ashley Gray. I'm the Disability and Learning Skills Advisor at the School of Continuing Studies. And I'll let my colleague introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Annie Balot. I'm the Learning Skills Specialist on Maine Campus. Um, again, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we are going to do a Q&A at the end, so if you have questions as we talk about material, um, go ahead and um, write those in the chat box or save them towards the end and we'll get to them. Okay, as always, um, just to stay up to date on ARC News, when our upcoming webinars are, um, you can follow us on Facebook at ARC Georgetown or on Instagram at ARC under slash Georgetown. Um, we also do post free app Friday there, so learn about some more amazing apps that we talked about from last week. Um, so follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And here is the schedule for the rest of our academic success webinar series for the spring semester. So in the beginning of the semester, we did a webinar navigating campus resources as well as get to know helpful apps. Both of those are archived on our website um, under academic success webinar series tab under academic support. Um, today, just like Ashley said, we're going to talk about classroom engagement. Our next webinar is going to be after spring break on the writing lab and how to, why it's important to cite citations, um, cite sources, and that's going to be conducted by our colleague at the writing lab um, in SES. And then at the end of March, we're going to do a webinar on public speaking. Um, beginning of April, we'll do a webinar on group work, and then of course, ending the semester on a great positive note on how to really prep for finals. So stay tuned for those upcoming webinars. And again, everything will be archived on our website once a webinar has um, been completed. Awesome. All right, so as I said, um, today's topic is classroom engagement. Um, so let's start off by talking about what classroom engagement is. So really what it is, is how you as a student are interacting with the material, your professor, your peers in the class, um, your homework, your notes, and the study material. So it's more than just showing up and sitting in class, right? Um, it's how you interact with the material, interacting with the peers. Um, and all of this is really to promote active learning. And this helps you develop a deeper connection to the material to strengthen your retention. And that's really, really important, especially as you move along in your college career and material builds on top, on top of each other. Um, so a few things to consider when we're talking about classroom engagement, and we're going to go into a little bit more details about this later in the presentation, but the first thing is your learning style, which Annie will be talking about next. Um, what are your own academic goals? And we're going to talk about creating goals and what that looks like. Um, what are the curricular goals of the course, right? Like, what is it that your professor wants you to learn? These are usually outlined in your syllabi. Um, so at the beginning of the semester, I always recommend for students to go in and look at what the curricular goals are. That's going to give you some idea of what the expectations of the course are. Um, how do you interact with course material? So we're going to be talking about classroom participation, some more on active learning. And then most importantly, what are you doing outside the classroom? So showing up to class, yes, half the battle. But um, what are you doing outside of the class, I think, is what really makes the difference for students um, in kind of getting to that next level and increasing retention. Great, so let's first tackle learning styles, and there's a lot more information on learning styles on our website. There is a learning styles assessment that you can take to really determine what your peak learning style is or where more your predominant learning style is. So learning styles speak to the understanding that every student learns differently, and we know this. So really learning styles is break, broken down into three different types. Um, and an individual's learning style refers to the preferential way in which the student understands information. So the three types of learning styles are visual, auditory, and haptic. Visual we know as you see the material. You can kind of understand the material better when you see it. So this is looking at um, you know, notes as you're reading or creating flashcards or doing diagrams and kind of looking at a visual representation of material. So really kind of visually capturing the material. Auditory is listening, so being able to uh, work well in those lecture-style classrooms when professors are 
um, giving a lot of information and you're kind of taking in that information through your ears. And then haptic is working best with material by um, kind of doing. doing it, right? So maybe making models or maybe making diagrams or really kind of working with material in a hands-on manner. Um, so again, more information is listed on our website about learning styles, take an assessment, see which one is predominant to you, and then really tailor your studying um, in the classroom as well as actually set outside of the classroom towards your learning style, and that's going to be really important. And I think one important thing to note about learning styles is that you can be a little mix of all three. I think both Annie and I have taken it, and I end up showing a kind of equal amount between visual and auditory. And so it doesn't, there's no right way with the learning style, but just having that understanding of it is really helpful, even for me as I'm setting up my day doing work and setting goals. Right. It could just be more of like a guide for how you're going to start studying for certain classes or start um, recording your notes in special ways, depending on what your learning style is. So it's not an end-all, be-all way, but it's definitely a good guide for your academics. All right. So question, how can your learning style impact you in the classroom? So just like we mentioned, learning style is really important for how you actually take in information. If you're a visual person, if you're an auditory person, it really is going to be dependent on how you're actually going to retain that information. So if you know that you're a visual person, having the PowerPoints printed out prior to class is going to be really helpful. Taking notes during class is going to be helpful for everybody, but especially for somebody that is a visual learner. Um, if you are um, an auditory learner, really paying attention and kind of you're going to soak in that information from the words of the professors and the certain cues of the professor. Um, so really kind of understanding your learning style and how you actually do take in information is definitely a good component to think about. And how engaged do you stay in the subject matter? Again, um, thinking about your learning style and what types of study strategies are going to be tailored best towards your learning style. How are you going to be able to stay actively engaged in the classroom? Not just sitting there like Ashley said, that is half the battle, but how can you stay engaged? Is taking notes really helpful? Is highlighting going to be really helpful? Um, is kind of doing certain things going to help you stay engaged and really stay focused and really understand the material at a deeper level? And then class participation, definitely something to think about um, when it comes to your learning style. Um, of course, how do you record information? Again, kind of talked about this. If you're a visual person, really making sure that you are taking notes and highlighting and underlining to really stay engaged. Um, if you're an auditory person, maybe a professor will allow you to capture lectures um, via computer, kind of audio recording, or if not, um, thinking of a way, how can you um, listen back to presentations or maybe listen to recordings or videos that are related to the material presented in the classroom really to understand that material at a deeper level. Yeah, and one of the ways that I love to do it is if with, if you can't record in the classroom, one a great way if you're an auditory learner is to maybe record your notes um, yourself and that way you're kind of cementing that information again into your brain, but you can listen to them as you're walking around campus or doing errands, and it's just another way to gain that information that really um, works with your learning style. Yes, yeah. perfect. All right, so I touched a little bit about this at the beginning, but um, I think creating academic goals is something that's so important, um, especially if you're a freshman or a sophomore, um, and really kind of setting intention for your semester and your time here at the university. Um, and I think for one way, to kind of create academic goals, and I think the easiest way to do it is to set goals for each of your classes. Um, and that's, you know, you can create long-term goals and short-term goals. So um, a goal could be, a long-term goal could be developing a solid foundation of your major course material, right? Because you wanna make sure that as you go along in your, your major and your career here that you're very comfortable with the material, especially as you get to those harder level courses. Um, so thinking about that as the long-term goal, you want to take um, set maybe some short-term goals. And one of the things that you that I like to think about in setting short-term goals is that they're actionable steps that you can take. So very, you know, they don't have to be these overwhelming big things. So what are some, you know, very doable things that you can do in the moment that you don't feel overwhelmed by? Um, and if your long-term goal is to set a solid foundation for your course material, an actionable step is maybe spending 15 minutes after every class reviewing your notes. 
that's just going to submit the material one more time. Maybe that's a meeting with a peer in your course um, courses to talk about the material, to interact with material in that way. Those are very small, actual items, but I think the impact is very long term um, and very big as you kind of move through your career. What about, Ashley, what about a short-term goal of setting up a study group for each of your classes and having like a consistent schedule that you guys meet every week or bi-weekly? Because as we know about learning styles and talking about, talking to somebody about materials really helps, really helps with retention. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a great example, Annie, especially because then um, another thing that we talked about a lot, you're dedicating that study time, right? So it's there every week, you have that commitment to it, so as the weeks get crazier coming up to midterms, you still have that hour, two hours carved out. Um, and as you said, talking about the material, interacting with that material based on your learning style, and we'll talk a little bit about in terms of active learning later, helps cement that information. So great example. Um, some other things to consider when you're creating academic goals. Um, this might be when you want to consult with your academic team or academic advisor. They have a really good perspective on the expectations for you as you move through your major, what your courses look like, um, what you should be getting out of certain courses. They understand what the professors are looking for. Um, go with them. Talk about what kind of goals you want to create for yourself long-term, both long-term and short-term. Um, learn how to be your boat own best advocate. So this one is really kind of how are you taking ownership over your educational goals, right? Um, are you utilizing the resources we have available on campus? Are you going to CAPS when you're feeling stressed out? Are you coming to the ARC to talk with one of us about um, time management or study skills? Um, how are you being your own best advocate? Are you taking advantage of your office hours your TA is providing? Um, I think that's a really important kind of motivational factor when we talk about creating academic goals. Um, another thing to think about is think about quality, not quantity. Um, I think this is a really big one, especially for our students. I think sometimes we get overwhelmed by all the things that we think we need to be doing or being accomplished. And as we know, the more you try to take on um, over the course of time, the more stress it can create and the harder it is to accomplish those things. So my recommendation, and I know Annie speaks with a lot about this with her students, is taking it kind of like one step at a time. What is one goal that you can work on for the next couple of weeks? What's that one short-term actionable item? Is it you know, creating a study group? Is it the 15 minute review of notes after class? Work on that. Once you feel that you've accomplished that, then you can kind of move on to your other goals. Um, prioritize. This is, this is, you know, the intention of goals and creating goals. And um, we talk a lot about on our website, we have a great worksheet um, on SMART goals, right? Are they specific, measurable, actionable? Um, how are you evaluating? What's the timetable on those? Um, and so what, how are you prioritizing with all the other things that you go on? And goals can help you do this. Um, and my recommendation for students to always remember to keep those goals a priority, write it down on a sticky note, um, type it in as a reminder on your phone to pop up at the beginning of every day at 9 a.m. So you, you remember that and you remember what your intention is for that day. And then most importantly, balance. Again, we all have a lot going on. You should not be just sitting here focusing just on all of your goals, not having a little bit of a social life, enjoying what the city, what the university has to offer. So putting in that balance, it should not be study all the time, um, but how are you finding that balance? All right, so kind of getting into the meat of what we're talking about today. Um, as I said, active learning is a really big part of classroom engagement. And I think if you can kind of get a grasp on active learning and what your learning style is and how to be a better active learner, um, you'll really see your classroom engagement go up. Um, so first, I want to talk about active listening, um, and this is something that you guys have probably heard about since all the way back since elementary school, but do we really know what it means, and do we really know how to be an active listener? So active listening intentionally focuses on who you're listening to, whether it's in a lecture, a conversation, or in a group, in order to understand what is said. As the listener, you should then be able to replay or repeat back in your own words what they have said to their satisfaction. 
Um, it doesn't mean that you necessarily agree with them, but you understand what they're saying. And I think the key kind of phrase in that is that you're able to re replay back in your own words. When we talk about retention and we talk about study habits and we talk about getting ready for finals, one of the biggest tips we talk about is being able to summarize the material in your own words. And if you can do that, it shows that you are grasping the material. If you aren't, if you're struggling with being able to put concepts or theories or equations in your own words, that might be a cue that you might need to go get a little extra help, visit office hours, talk to a friend about it. So that's the, kind of the first component about active learning. Um, the second component is looking and seeing. So when you look at images such as pictures, graphs, or maps, um, try to understand it, the use and the importance of each image. So how is it relating to the material? Um, what keywords come to mind? Um, are there verbal, verbal cues such as titles and authors and visual cues such as line? color, visual organization that will help you interpret information and understand its story without the words. Um, so often the context of the image is vital to understanding it as illustrations in a textbook, um, such as graphs in a financial statement, um, even with paintings to understand time, art, and movement. Um, and this is especially important if you're a visual learner, like Annie mentioned, you'll really take to this and understand kind of those visual cues. How do you catalog them and relate them back to the information you're learning? Wonderful. So the next one we're going to talk about is seeing and hearing. So how can you witness how concepts are practiced in real life situations? Another study tip before we kind of dive into this, that I always recommend to students is create associations with material. It really helps with understanding with retention. So thinking about real life examples, real life scenarios that maybe you've endured or friends have endured or that you've heard in you know some sort of TV show or movie when you're trying to understand a concept, really understanding and kind of relating certain topics to examples really helps with retention. Okay. So in addition to PowerPoint lectures, media and movies and books and pictures and diagrams have the advantage of illustrating reading and lectures in a new and engaging format. Okay, so it's really about how can you kind of bring down these concepts to more engaging information and formats. So demonstrations and how you learn outside of the classroom can build on these classroom experiences and provide you with a shared learning experience on a topic. Okay, how can it be related to something that happened in your childhood or something that you saw in a movie? Really kind of witnessing how these concepts um, are related to real life experiences. Okay, and then the last one is saying and doing. So the more that you work with the content, the more confident you will become in recalling it. So this definitely sounds like a haptic learner, right? Someone that's engaged kind of in a hands-on manner. Um, so the more work you do with the content, the more confident you will be in recalling it. Um, so examples may include doing an interview or role play or debating with somebody about opposing view, viewpoints on a certain topic in history class or um, joining in on a debate for you know any type of course kind of talking about material in a conversational way really kind of plays into this this aspect of active learning okay so this is a um, what did we call this Ashley the cone of learning. The cone of learning. Okay. So as you can see um, at the top, it says learning activities and what we tend to remember after two weeks. Okay. So again, this is kind of our time frame is two weeks. And as you can see at the top of our cone of learning, if students just read, they're only going to kind of retain 10% of the information that they remember, right? Then as you can see, as the cone moves further and further to the bottom, listening, if I'm going to read and listen, okay, maybe I'm gonna retain 20% of the information, but I'm gonna build on it. What if I read, listen, and I look and see? So I'm gonna view art, I'm gonna look at graphs, I'm gonna look at maps, wow, you can see my retention of the material is slowly increasing. And then you see the big bulk of the, the pyramid is seeing and hearing. So I'm gonna look at movies, and I'm gonna look at, maybe there's a TED talk online that really relates to the content, or I'm going to take a field trip on my own to a museum that relates to certain concepts discussed in class, because it's really gonna cement the information more in my mind, because I'm relating an experience to it. And you can see 50% comes of retention comes from that seeing and hearing portion, right? And then we can kind of 
go our way down the pyramid and we see speaking, talking back with the material is going to be 70%, and we're really engaging in that active learning portion, which is what we've been talking about. And then 90% saying and doing. Are you doing a presentation or a simulation, or is there some tutoring involved? You're teaching back to the material. You're doing some live demonstration that really helps cement the concepts. And again, that 90% of engagement is really where we want to be at. And I think one point, Annie, to make out, like, it doesn't always have to be these very formalized mm -hmm. presentations. It literally can be you um, while you're, you know, getting ready for bed one night, repeating back to, you know, what you learned that day, summarizing the material, or talking to your roommate about it. It's just more about actually engaging with it in those different means to really make sure you fully understand it and feel confident. Mm -hmm. And one thing I tell students all the time, a really good study strategy, especially for foreign languages or information that, again, you are going to understand it more when you talk back to somebody or talk back with the material, is record yourself. Use a voice memo app on our phones. Record yourself speaking in a foreign language or record yourself practicing for a presentation that you have. And then you can actually listen back to it. Okay? So you're really playing into those learning styles, but you can really kind of check for understanding. So that type of engagement is really going to enhance your retention. That's a perfect segue into active learning strategies. Um, so all the things we just talked about, those kind of four categories of active listening, saying and doing, seeing and hearing, speaking, um, these are just some simple kind of boiled down strategies that you can implement. And again, you don't need to implement all of these at once, but like pick one or two that speak to you or speak to your learning style and kind of see how you can incorporate that into your work. So some easy ones, um, again, make notes in your own words. That really, I think, is a huge cue to um, gauge whether or not you're um, retaining the material. Um, talk to a peer about the information that goals for your studying. Yeah, I think the, the first one, too, asking questions as you read, that's definitely something that Ashley and I tell our students all the time. Don't just go into a reading kind of not even knowing what's going on in the reading um, or what type of information you're going to be seeking. So really using the discussion questions in lectures or in the in, from lectures or in the textbook to really guide your reading and seek information. You're going to be more actively engaged in the reading rather than just reading just to read, right? Yeah, and I think another point off that for the last bullet point about think about how the new information interacts with what you've already learned, that's something you can also incorporate with your reading. What did you just learn in class that how does this impact the reading? What, how is that information relatable? And taking notes on that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, just some other strategies that we've come up with. I really liked bullet point two, so try different ways of writing notes. And we've come up with some presentations and webinars on note taking and different forms of outlining. Um, and one that kind of comes to mind is mind mapping, right? We just mm -hmm. did one on mind mapping, which is a visual representation of certain notes. So it might not be word or um, outlining in written form. It's more of diagrams and seeing how things relate to one another. So for our visual learners, that could be a really good way to capture information that you're trying to really understand. Maybe it's a certain process or something um, that's kind of more difficult and that type of note taking is going to be helpful for you to understand it a little bit more thoroughly. Yeah. Um, I think some other examples that I really, again, hit home on a lot, go to your professors and TA's office hours. Um, they have those office hours for you, and I think a lot of times they are severely underutilized. So go there if you're not for sure on a reading or unfor sure about something that's said during class. Follow up with your professor. Um, think about, you know, what questions you want to go to your professor with and how they can help. Um, and my favorite, favorite one is self-testing regularly. And I think this is something you talk a lot about, Annie. Um, it's just about kind of those quick gut checks of where you are with the material. Um, and it also just helps you get in the practice of taking exams. So if you, you know, might feel a little stressed out kind of going into exams, kind of getting that practice in of self-testing makes you more comfortable with the material and kind of helps you, um, you know, think about what to expect on exams. Um, again, engaging in the reading activities. Um, and then the last one, which I think we're going to talk a little bit about more, is classroom participation. And I think classroom participation is a huge game changer for a lot of students, just not in how they're engaging with the material, but also I think sometimes professors have classroom participation attached to percentage of grades and syllabi. 
Yeah, I think this is one that a lot of students get very kind of apprehensive about, like how much participation is is a good amount or like what should I be doing? What does classroom participation mean? Um, so here we kind of break it down into some strategies to think about how can you be an active participant in the classroom? Not just sitting there, not just showing up, but how can you actually be an active participant? So we say start slowly, right? So don't think day one you have to kind of fill out all of your insights and give all of this you know, great presentation right off the bat. So really start slowly, think about how can you kind of work your way up in your class participation throughout the semester. Um, one of the main strategies that I talk to students about is making sure that you have some go-to notes before entering the class that you're comfortable with presenting. So this could be regarding a homework activity. It could be a question that you've developed and want to um, ask during class. But having you know a few bullet points on a post-it note or in your planner or in your notebook that you are comfortable, you've already kind of pre-vetted and you're comfortable with asking and that's that's really going to help you um, have the courage and kind of find find your voice in the classroom. Yeah, some other ones that I think are just kind of easy ways to ease yourself into classroom participation. Volunteer to correct homework activities I think is a great one. Um, also just great in terms of feedback for you. Um, and then participate as much as possible in group work with your peers. Um, maybe you're a little bit more comfortable in like smaller group settings. Not all of us are made for those large lecture classes, even though sometimes we have to do it. So can you engage a little bit more in those smaller group settings? That's the way to kind of um, test the waters out and get yourself comfortable with going back to the bigger group and participating. Um, and then I think another great example is progressively answering discussions in the class setting. So again, just like athletes warm up before a big game, warm yourself up, so, you know, maybe just provide a little bit of feedback um, at the very beginning and then work your way up towards the end of class of participating more. Great, just some other things to think about, just like Ashley mentioned, maybe comment earlier in the class period. So a lot of class participation students have anxiety around it, right? So they kind of think, oh gosh, it's halfway through the class time and I still haven't said anything. It's 45 minutes into the class time, I haven't said anything. So maybe to ease that anxiety that you feel, maybe comment earlier in the class period. Maybe it's a smaller comment. Maybe, like Ashley said, it's just commenting on a homework um, so that you can kind of take that pressure off and you can actually be engaged in the material and listen actively and not be so worried about participating, right? Yeah. Um, I think the other thing, thinking about bullet two, is add on to a peer's initial insight by providing an example piggyback off of what somebody else said. So if one of your peers had a great comment or insight and you can think, oh man, this, this reminds me of this example or I have something to add to that, great. Raise your hand and provide an example um, and that would be a great way to provide um, you know, your insights into classroom. Yeah, and another one I love is bullet three, contribute your own perspective, you can't be wrong. Um, that's an easy way to participate in the classroom. And I also think it, sometimes it's very valuable for your peers um, in the class because we all view information through different lenses. We all take it in, process it differently. So maybe the way that you kind of take in the information and the perspective that you provide on it actually might be a huge kind of like aha click moment for your, another one of your students because they're able to really get that information that way. Um, I know for a lot of times when I'm in the class, when sitting there and hearing someone else's students say it, kind of in their own words, I'm like, oh, I get it now. Um, asking for clarification or an explanation, you can't go wrong for asking for that. Um, and I guarantee you, if you have that question, there are probably three other or four other students in the class who also have that question. Um, some other ones, just ask follow-up questions on a previous lecture, another student's question. If you're still confused about something, ask about it. Um, even if it's not in the class, go ask about it in office hours. But make sure you clarify that. And I think the biggest and most important one is to not overthink. Um, you're here to learn. It's supposed to be safe spaces. We all come at it with different lens. Don't overthink about, you know, how much you're participating because, as Annie said, you're going to be so consumed by kind of that stress and worry about, am I participating enough, that you're going to miss out on all the great material. Wonderful. Awesome. So um, we're going to do a couple of questions right now. Um, if you want to type, uh, if you have a question, you can type it in the chat box and we'll get to it. Um, so we'll give you guys a minute or two and then we'll go ahead and answer those questions.
Okay, so we have two questions that came in. Um, the first one says, even though active learning entails other tasks besides reading, most of my classes require a heavy reading load, which I think a lot of students can relate to, right? So they said, how can I still be an active learner while reading and kind of managing this reading load? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think we touched on it a little bit, but um, are you kind of setting goals for your reading? Like, are you seeing, are you asking questions as you're reading? Um, you know, if you read kind of a couple of sections, take a pause, ask yourself some questions. Um, again, hitting home our favorite study strategy, which is, are you summarizing the reading in your own words? Um, are you seeing how that reading interacts with the material in class? Um, are you taking notes while you're reading? I know a lot of times we all think we're reading, but we're not critically reading. And I think one way we can always think about critically reading is taking notes, and, um, asking those questions, summarizing the reading. One, you're gonna be more prepared for class the next day, but two, you're gonna retain that information better and find those connections between other readings and your coursework and your discussions. So I think that's, um, those are some kind of easy strategies to implement. Yep, absolutely. And you know, as you are reading, is there a video on a concept that you just need a little bit more information on and kind of thinking about your learning style and really hearing a video or maybe there's a movie or something that really cements and kind of hits home these concepts that you can use after reading to really um, you know firm up your understanding maybe there's a diagram that kind of helps you connect the dots as you're reading so kind of thinking about other ways um, to really kind of engage in the material is helpful as well and I think um, Annie I think you make a great point we do actually have a webinar about kind of previewing skimming outlining and reading um, and previewing the chapter is a great way to kind of stay engaged with reading, looking at what the headlines are, what are the subtitles, what are the pictures, what are the graphs, preview that reading, maybe set some goals, kind of set some perimeter questions around that. Um, and we have, again, you can go to our website and under the academic support tab, click on academic success webinars, and I believe it's called skimming, scanning, and outlining is the webinar. Great. So our second question that came in says, what happens if I was not able to fully understand the assigned reading, but I still want to participate in class? What do I do? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think one way you can do that is ask your clarifying question in class. Um, I think that's an easy way. Um, we're not, you're not always, as much as we want you to come fully prepared to class, and you should make every effort to do that, there are going to be times when you don't fully understand all the material or um, maybe you couldn't get to that last paragraph of the reading because you fell asleep. Um, but, you know, come with your clarifying questions. That's a great, easy way to participate in class. I also think sometimes if you can't maybe um, really kind of sit there and theorize on the content, offer your own perspective or follow up on a, another student's perspective like we talked about. Um, those are some easy ways, but again, I think the first and foremost is ask your clarifying questions. I guarantee you, again, other students are going to have those questions as well. Yep, absolutely. All right, I think that's it for questions. So again, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, you can provide us feedback on our webinar feedback form. It's https colon backslash backslash tinyurl.com backslash ARC webinar feedback. Um, and again, we are going to be off um, for in spring break. So we all hope you are having a wonderful spring break in a week and a half, I believe. Um, but we will come back swinging with our next webinar um, on March 13th at noon, um, same time, same location, um, same Zoom link. And again, we will be joined by our colleague, Sharla, from the Writing Lab at SES, and she's going to give us some great information on citation. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining us, and we hope to see you on March 13th. Bye.